over here. We're going to let the video play for a second. And we will be ready. Well, happy Friday, everybody. Yep. Here the video is playing. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Manufacturing E-Commerce Success Series. We are so excited today. I'm your one of your hosts, Damon Pastalka, with me today. I've got my co-host, Kurt Anderson, who we had some good stuff happening this week. I want to talk about that later. But right now, I'm going to give it over to Kurt so Kurt can wow. introduce the incredible, absolutely incredible guest we've got this week. <laughs> yeah, she she she's she's really good at downplaying downplaying the thing. But if you if you haven't, I mean. I'm just going to let Kurt take care of it from there. I'm going to do a little housekeeping. If you're listening to us on LinkedIn Live, go ahead and put in the comments where you're listening from. Shout out some good stuff to us. Tell us what you're up to. Same thing here. If you're with us on Remo here, go ahead and add some stuff into the chat and get ready to go. So Kurt Anderson, take it over, man. Damon, thank you. What a great week. So I'm actually, I'm up in Seattle this week and Damon is already here. So we've had a wonderful week. Guys, this is, today is my Mount Everest, man. This is such an honor. I'm starstruck. I'm like, I might, I might get choked up today, Allison. So Allison Levine, I have a long, long intro for you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today on our little program. What an honor and privilege to have you. Thank you. Oh, I feel honored and privileged to be here. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you guys today. Absolutely. So let me just share a little bit about our dear friend, Allison Levine. So, you know, Allison, what an, what an underachiever, you know, let's take a look at a few <laughs> yeah, things. No doubt. So let's take it. Let's take a look at a few things. So we have University of Arizona grad, go Wildcats. We have an MBA from Duke, go Blue Devils. I'm I'm always curious who you root for and if those two pair up. Wall Street alumni, right? Goldman Sachs, highly sought after keynote speaker. You are uh, an adventurer's. You've accomplished the adventurer's grand slam. Mm -hmm. Can you share with everybody yeah. that's never heard of the adventurer's grand slam? Yes. What is that? Yes. So the adventure grand slam is climbing the seven summits, which is the highest peak on each continent, and then skiing to both the North and the South Pole. I think now there's about 20 people in the world who've completed the Adventure Grand Slam. But at the time when I did it back in 2010, I think there were just a couple of us. So um, yeah, that's the Adventure Grand Slam. This is elite as it comes. Now you have a best-selling book, On the Edge. I've had the honor. I read the book. I read it with my daughter as a girl dad, a teenage, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a the book right, right there. Yeah, right there. I yeah. just read it for the second time this week. My daughter and I have a teenager and she looks up to you. She wanted me to tell you, hello, you are such Aww. an inspiration for all of us dads with, with young daughters. So thank you. So New York Times bestselling book. I dropped your LinkedIn profile, your website, and a link to your book oh, in the chat box, guys. So please check out On the Edge. I'm telling you, it is an amazing, amazing book. Allison has an incredible TED Talk about yeah. her adventures. So Allison, I, and I dedicated friend. the book to my dog, by the way. So that Trooper. You, yeah, you have to read, don't skip the introduction to the book. And, I dedicated to him. and you have a forward from coach K for any of our, our basketball fans out there. So let's dig right in Allison. So yes. you're uh, is a young girl growing up in Phoenix, Arizona. It's 110 degrees out. Of course, every girl's dream in Phoenix is Let's go skiing across the North and South Pole. Let's climb Mount Everest. Where where did this even come from? Yeah. Right. Okay, okay, okay. So take <laughs> take you back to my childhood in Phoenix. So yes, you mentioned I grew up in Phoenix and I growing up, I always wanted to be an air conditioning repair woman because <laughs> I thought like, you know, high demand and job security. Like those uh, yeah. are the things, high demand, job security, air conditioning repair woman. Um, but when I also was very, always very intrigued by the stories of the early Arctic and Antarctic explorers, the early mountaineers, I would read these books and watch these documentaries. I think because it felt like an escape from the oppressive summer heat in Phoenix. So I'd read the books and I'd watch the films, but I never thought I would actually go to those places because I had some health challenges growing up. I was, um, I was born with a hole in my heart. So I've had three heart surgeries, but I didn't get diagnosed until I was 17 because I grew up in this very tough love family. And we, my mom always had these rules, no whining, no crying, no complaining. So mm. I, when I felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest and it was hard to breathe, I'd be afraid to like whine too much about it because my parents didn't allow whining. So I would say, oh, mom, I think, I feel like something's wrong with my heart. And she'd say, oh, 
you're fine. Like you're probably just nervous for your piano recital. And I'm like, no, mom, I don't think that's it. And she's like, how do you know? I'm like, because I don't take piano lessons. It's like my brother took the piano lessons and um, yeah. I mean, these space shuttle parents, I feel like, or these helicopter parents I always say, I feel like I had space shuttle parents because they were like, not so tuned into everything we were doing. But I said, you know, at the as I got older, the hole got bigger. And I was like, no, mom, I really feel like something's wrong. Oh, we'd say, go down the street, talk to our neighbor, Dr. Clark, tell him what's wrong. Maybe he can figure it out. I'm like, mom, Dr. Clark is a veterinarian. So- <laughs> Unless you need me to get, you know, spayed or microchipped, I do not think Dr. Clark is the answer here. But so anyway, got worse as I got older. When I was 17, I lost consciousness. And the friends I was with at the time had the good sense to rush me to the emergency room where I was diagnosed with this life-threatening heart condition. And so I had my first surgery when I was 17. Um, it wasn't successful. I had another one when I turned 30. And about 18 months after that heart surgery, the one that went well, this light bulb went on in my head. And I thought, if I want to know what it's like to be this explorer Reinhold Messner and drag a 150 pound sled across 600 miles of Antarctic ice, then I should go to Antarctica and try that. If I want to know what it's like to be these mountaineers going to these remote mountain ranges, and I should go to the remote mountain ranges instead of just reading about them or watching documentaries about them. And if these other guys can do this stuff, you know, why, why can't I do it too? So I climbed my first mountain when I was 32 years old and wow. uh, I haven't stopped since. So so yeah, and I'm 55 now. So it's been a while, but it's not like I started when I was, you know, in my 20s or anything like that. So I would say it's never too late to start living your, you know, living your adventure. And this awesome 32 years old. What an inspiration. And what's awesome, Allison, is I love it. You're on Wall Street, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a grind. So you're putting in your 15, 16, 18 hour days, if I recall. If you, and you guys, you have to go get the book. I'm telling you, if you don't do anything else today, please get Allison's book. And Allison, in the book you describe, I absolutely love this. So you're going to start training for, for mountain climbing and you're grinding this, this Wall Street career. And so you'd go to the gym at like midnight. And talk a little bit about that. Like you're, you're on the yeah. bike, biking, okay. sleeping, like describe that. So let me just preface this by saying that I wrote this book before we knew how bad sleep deprivation was for, <laughs> for you, right? So now they've tied lack of sleep to all these, you know, different terrible conditions and diseases. Right. And we know that we know that sleep is just as important as healthy eating and exercising in a healthy overall life. It's part of a healthy overall lifestyle. But back then, no one talked about that. You yeah. know, remember back in the days where it was a badge of honor to be like, yeah, I only sleep three hours a night. Right, right. I'm Elon Musk still, right? I don't know. He yeah. says he sleeps like two hours if he, right. if he even sleeps. But anyway, so um, I was working and I was a brand new associate at Goldman Sachs. And I, in like, so everyone, it's kind of this contest of who can work the most hours, right? Who can come in the earliest and stay the latest because that means you're the most dedicated. And so people are coming in early, staying late. So I was coming into the office, getting into the office by 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And I was working all day. And then I was, you know, going home. And then I was trying to fundraise. So I was the team captain for the American Women's Everest Expedition. Mm -hmm. So I had to fundraise for that trip. I was just out of grad school. I had $70,000 of debt. And by the way, as a new associate working at Goldman Sachs, I had a healthy five-figure income, five figures, not six figures, certainly not seven figures. So I I couldn't afford it. It was $25,000 person could ever. So I couldn't afford that. I had $70,000 of debt. And so we had to raise the funds for the trip. And um, I ended up getting Ford, Ford came on board as our sponsor, but basically I would get home late at night. And then I had, I was still fundraising for the trip. So I was trying to fundraise. I was trying to raise a money for a cancer research grant for this organization called the V foundation, which was very near and dear to my heart. And so I'd come home from work, I would eat dinner, I would fundraise, I'd send pitch letters, trying to get sponsorship. And then like now it's like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, it's 12 a.m. And I have to train and sleep. And I basically only had between 12 and 4, 4.30 to do those things because it's in my office by 5.30. So I would go to 24-hour fitness because it's open 24 hours, hence the name. 
And I would get on, this is so bad, you guys, I do not recommend this. <laughs> I would get on cardio equipment that I could do with my eyes closed, like get on the bike or get on the Stairmaster. And I would try to convince myself that I was sleeping and working out at the same time. Yeah. And yeah. obviously you're not doing either of those things. You're not getting sleep. You're not getting a good workout. But I would just be like, oh yeah, sleep, sleep, sleeping. This feels good. I'm sleeping. You know, and so I would convince myself that I was sleeping while I was exercising. And so then of course I would get to work and I would just be completely exhausted. And sometimes I would go in the bathroom and I would just cry from sleep deprivation because I was so tired and people would walk in the bathroom and they'd be like, oh, what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm like, I'm just really tired. And they're like, I know, Allison, we're all tired you know, and, um, in, this, in this crazy world that we live in. But um, so I obviously was not doing either thing very efficiently or effectively. So then I had to can that idea. And I, I just designated weekends as my training time. So I really didn't train during the week. I just trained on weekends and I went up to Mount Shasta. I was living in Northern California. So Mount Shasta is about a five hour drive from where I lived. And I would just focus my whole weekend on training. So that way I could do my job during the week because it wasn't fair to my colleagues for me to show up and do a half ass job. You know, you owe it to your teammates to give it your all. That's part of being a team. And so I, I wanted to really remain as focused as I could during the week and then just really focused on training on the weekends. Right. Perfect. Man, this is so good. So guys, Allison Levine, I have her LinkedIn profile. You have to buy her book. So Allison, uh, and I probably I, I probably have a ton of other things to mention on your, your resume. If I did mention adjunct professor at West Point, super active. You mentioned uh, Coach V with his foundation. You're active with Coach K and, and uh, you've been on his board. And Coach K, uh, you, you talk when you so for anybody who doesn't know, Allison was the team leader of the first all-women's team to climb Mount Everest. So kudos to you. Again, my dear friend Alex is on a call today. Our daughters are figure skaters together. You're uh -huh. an inspiration to our daughters. And so when you put together that team, and you talk about Coach K in the book extremely admirably, you talk about team ego. And you talk about, and again, I don't want to ruin anything in the book because you have to buy the book, but talk about team ego. I'll tell, yeah, I want to, I'm really glad you touched on that because um, it's, it's an interesting way to look at recruiting, you know, whether you're recruiting athletes, an expedition team, or employees for your organization. Right. So I, I always heard this, like, leave your ego at the door thing, right? right? And so when I was on the board of the Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics, so for people who aren't familiar with Coach K, I'll give you a little background, uh, head men's basketball coach at Duke University and the winningest coach in the history of Division I men's basketball. Um, and for those of you who don't care about college basketball, and for Duke haters, because I know you are out there, Crazy. Not here, not here. Right. I know you're out there. Bear with me for a second with this Coach K story because yeah. Coach K was also the head men's basketball coach of the U.S. national team, right, or U.S. men's Olympic team, and they brought home several gold medals. So even if you hate Duke, you still kind of have to have an appreciation for that, right? So um, when I was on the board of the Coach K Center, uh, we had breakfast with him a number of times. And I remember this one breakfast where the team had just come back from winning a gold. And we were talking to him about what he looks for when he's recruiting a team, because I thought, how do you, how do you figure out who you want on the court, right? When you have a job, a tough job that needs to get done, how do you figure out who you want on the court? And he had an interesting answer. He said that when he's recruiting a team, what he looks for is ego. And I was like, yeah, right. Cause you don't want that. Cause you gotta, you want to weed those guys out first. Like I get it. And he said, no. You want ego. And I thought, what are you talking about? This goes against everything I've read in every management and leadership book. And he went on to explain it. And then it made a lot of sense. He said that when he's recruiting a team, there's two kinds of ego that he looks for. The first is what he calls performance ego. He said, I want people who are good and who know that they're good. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't want LeBron James to come out onto the court and be a wuss. I need him to be LeBron James with all the confidence that goes with him. And I thought, okay, that actually does make sense because I certainly do not want to be climbing Mount Everest with a bunch of teammates who are thinking, 
oh gosh, I don't know. That looks really high. You know, maybe we're a little out of our league here, right? You want to be climbing with people who are thinking, I've got this, right? I've got this. So that's team ego or sorry, that's performance ego. Sure. The second kind of ego he looks for is what he calls team ego. He said, I want people on my team who are going to be proud to be a part of something that collectively feels more important than the individuals alone, right? Name on the front of the uniform, Team USA, is more important than the name on the back of the uniform, the individual name. And that made sense to me too, because I wanted women who are going to be proud to be a part of the first American women's Everest expedition, wear our country's flag on their sleeve. And so those are the that's what he looks for in terms of ego. Performance ego right? People who are good and know that they're good. And team ego is the one where, you know, yeah. you put the interests of the team in front of the interests of the individual. Right. Man, I absolutely love this. And I want to give a shout out our dear friend, you would love her. Our dear friend, Chris Harrington is on the call. Served our country. Chris served our country proudly as a vet. And she is the president and CEO of uh, Gen Alpha Technologies, cool e-commerce firm. So Elson, so what we do is we help manufacturers and we're trying to help them. You know, uh, I'm 52, so I'm right there with you. We're yeah. digital immigrants, you know, Gen Xers, baby boomers, and manufacturers are traditionally, you know, resistant to change. And you, in your book, you talk a lot about, uh, and I want to dig into this in a second, but before we get there, I love your message on complacency kills. Mm. Now, yeah. before we get, now, before we get into that, and, and that's a huge theme in your book, I'm just getting chills even thinking about you climbing over the ladders, uh, you know, yeah. from going base camp one or from base camp to base camp one. But talk, I, here's a question that I have, and it might sound uh, completely naive and ignorant for those of us that, you know, I climbed Mount Rainier this week, Damon. Did you know that? But, that is an ass kicker. Uh, Allison, what I did is I actually, I went to Crystal Mountain. I took the gondola with my 75-year-old uh, mother-in-law, my oh. daughter, and my, my wife. So I cheated, but I was at the top Mountaineers of the mountain are. looking at Rainier. But when to be the climb the levels that you've climbed, I mean, you I, nice. I don't, there's not a mountaineer on this planet that's more accomplished than you. Is it discipline? Plenty. Or is it courage? Like, there's do I, plenty it, that are more accomplished. Wait, I'll show you. Hang on. <laughs> Let me see if I can show you a picture. So we we're talking about complacency, right? And right. fear. I want to show you guys. Hang on. If well, and I, I, have your, I have your book right here. Wait. Okay. See this? Yeah. That crevasse you have to walk yep. over? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we ignore this. That's Antarctica. But the other page, I just want to show you guys. Right. Okay. The Kumbu Icefall. Kumbu it is the Kumbu Ice Fall is one of the scariest parts of the mountain because it's made up of 2,000 vertical feet of these big, huge moving ice chunks. And these ice chunks are massive. They're the size of small buildings. And then what happens is the sun comes up, everything starts to melt. So the ice chunks start to shift around. So you're in constant danger of being crushed by an ice block. But then there's also those, what I just showed you a picture of, these big open crevasses, these holes in the glacier where you could fall hundreds of feet to your death. So they span those rickety aluminum ladders that you saw in the photo. They span those ladders over them so you can get from one side to the other. And they're really, really scary. Mm -hmm. But I, that ice fall for me, even though it was incredibly frightening, it's a rem reminder that fear Fear is okay. It's just a normal human emotion. It's okay to feel fear. Fear, I think, can can work to my advantage because it keeps me alert and aware of everything going on around me. But complacency is what puts you at risk. Mm -hmm. Complacency is what will do you in. So don't ever beat yourself up for feeling scared or intimidated, right? Because again, just remind yourself this is normal human emotion. It just means I'm paying attention. I think you're something's wrong with you if you're not scared when you're going through that ice fall. But complacency is what puts you at risk. As things around you are constantly shifting and changing in that ice fall, right? Everything's melting. The ice blocks are changing. They're moving at a rate of four feet per day. The ladders are falling in when they melt out. You have to pay attention. So it's complacency that puts you at risk. And I think that we probably none of us have ever seen as much shifting and changing in the environment as what we have seen since COVID started, right? So now we're just used to that shifting and changing and we've had to get used to it. And yes, it can be scary because the reality is we have no idea what the rest of 2021 is going to look like. We don't know what next month is going to look like. We don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, yep. but we don't have to know 
what tomorrow is going to look like. We just have to know that we can get through each day. And sometimes it does feel scary because there is this fear of the unknown. But what I like to remind people is that you can be scared and brave at the same time. You can, you can be scared and brave at the same time. And that's what keeps me moving forward when I feel like the environment around me is, is incredibly sketchy. And that, you know what, and I'm glad I had one quote picked out. It's on page 82. And that's exactly what I was going to share. The Kumba Icefall taught me with the most critical lesson. Uh, let me get that out of the way. About mountaineering, business, leadership, and life. Fear is fine, but complacency will kill you. Yep. And, you know, and you go on exactly what, what you just said. And it's funny. And right here on page 82, you talk about uh, changes in life and how, you know, how you react to them. And it says when climbing, complacency can lead to extension extinction, threatening our livelihoods and our lives. And right in this book, when you wrote this, what, 2013, even if COVID hit, you wrote COVID right in this book, didn't you? Did you not? So, <laughs> I'm like, I predict that it's you COVID. predicted COVID. So, but that's what I love. So, so my, my question to you is to have to accomplish what you've accomplished and you are so humble. We, we love your humility. However, you are a true rock star. Yeah. You know, you're, so does it take, so does it take discipline? Or does it take courage? If you had okay. to pick one trait, yeah, of yeah, yeah. Two, what would you claim as your success? All right. I'm going to take you back for a moment to when I was first invited to serve as the team captain for the, mm -hmm. for the American Women's Everest Expedition. Initially, when they approached me to do that, I said no, because I just thought this just feels like too much challenge. I don't think I'm going to be good enough. I don't think I'm going to be fast enough. I don't think I'm going to be strong enough. I had all this self-doubt. And then all of a sudden I realized, okay, hang on. There's only going to be one first American women's Everest expedition. So if I don't step up to the plate to be the team captain, you know, somebody else is going to do it. Somebody else is be, you know, going to be living my dream adventure. So I ended up, you know, agreeing to serve as the team captain, but many times throughout the trip, that same doubt crept back into my head. I'm not going to be good enough. I'm not going to be fast enough. I'm not going to be strong enough. Mm -hmm. But what I realized throughout the expedition is that you do not have to be the best, fastest, strongest climber to get to the top of a mountain. You just have to be absolutely relentless about putting one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. That is the people that get to the top of Mount Everest and the top of big mountains. They aren't necessarily the most skilled or the most experienced. Yep. They're the people who are willing to suffer in the process, right? Who are willing to, ex to accept discomfort mm -hmm. and who are relentless. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to accept discomfort and you are relentless, that is how you get to the top of the mountain because so many people will quit because they're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And what you realize is that Discomfort is temporary, right? And you just you just put one foot in front of the other. Stop worrying about being the best or the fastest or the strongest. Just be the most relentless. I I love that. And you and you also talk about so again the coach, guys. Let's let's yeah. do a quick recap. You know, like team and performance, ego, right? Be relentless. Yeah. Discomfort. Be ability in the app to change. And as many you know, our manufacturers out there, this little thing came along called COVID. And now all of a sudden they couldn't go to trade shows. They their sales reps couldn't go on the road. Supply now going, chain issues and supply chain yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, yeah. you know, so so many changes here. And what you've talked about is like when you when you're making progress, and again, back to that complacency theme, turn around and change direction. You know, we, we'll leave that that sleep deprivation out. But don't uh let's talk about don't try to overcome weakness. And you share a great story in your book. We're not gonna ruin it because they have to go buy your book, but talk about. <laughs> In the South Pole, you had a great team experience. Yeah. We talk about like the weak link. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if I had, to, if you were to ask me what was the the expedition I learned the most from, mm -hmm. it was that South Pole expedition. Mm -hmm. Because uh, prior to that, when I had weak people on my teams, whether it was on an expedition and mm -hmm. business or whatever, like I would tend to get super frustrated. Like, why am I stuck with this, you know, this person on our team? Like if, and I would just be thinking, God, if only we didn't have that one person, right? It seems like oh, there's yeah. that yeah. one person every team that just can't quite perform at the same level as everybody else. So you're thinking, oh, if this person would only 
quit, they, transfer they, to another department, you know, maybe something heavy will fall on them, you yeah. know. Like it just, if we didn't have to deal, I would think if I didn't have to deal with this person, we'd be so much better, so much faster, so much more yeah. fit. Right. Okay. So South Pole Expedition, the goal, ski 600 miles across Antarctica to the South Pole. I'm sorry. How, how many, how many miles? 600 miles. With a drive sled. That yeah. You have a sled full of like 150 pound sled full of your gear and supplies that's harnessed to your waist. Right. So I trained, I did my homework. I did the research on the route. I did my research on previous expeditions. I trained as hard as I possibly could. I was sure that nobody could have trained harder than I did. Cause and where, where did you train Nelson? Uh, I trained the at the beach. beach. Like, the yeah. Beach I dragged hot car tires across the sand at the beach to simulate <laughs> dragging a heavy newscast of you like, uh, uh, from the San Francisco local news of you dragging yeah. your tires across the beach. So I'm sorry. I just had to throw that. Yeah, down. no. Well, I was dragging these tires in, in San Francisco and people thought I was homeless. So they, cause, uh, because <laughs> the tires, when you drag them along the sand, they, they collect everything yeah. that's all the debris. So it was yeah. like, beer bottles and milk right. cartons and like whatever. So I'm dragging these tires and they start bringing all the stuff. So people thought I was homeless and like dragging right. all my belongings with me. And so they would come up to me and offer me money and I would take it. <laughs> and so I trained and then I was like, okay, I'm ready. Cause I, I want to be a valuable team member. I want to be a contributor. Like I don't, I could be a weak person on my team. So I'm going to show up and be ready. So I trained as hard as I could. We get to Antarctica and with four other people, we're all from different countries. We get dropped off at the edge of the continent. And now we, we're going to start skiing to the South Pole. About first, first couple days, I'm slow. I'm slower than everybody else. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm just, it's going to take me some time to get used to the environment here. Antarctica's coldest, windiest place on earth. Well, as the days went on, I never got any better. I never got any faster. I could not keep up with my teammates. And now I was that person. Oh my. That person. Oh that my. weak link on the team. Mm -hmm. And no amount of training, desire, right. Right. heart was going to change that because even though I trained as hard as I possibly could, and I, you know, I was dedicated, I was, you know going to try as hard as I could. The law of physics basically dictates that somebody who is six foot three, six yeah. foot four, 230 pounds can drag a 150 pound sled a lot more quickly and a lot more efficiently than somebody who is five, four, you know, 110, 115 pounds. So I just couldn't keep up with my teammates. Mm -hmm. They were a foot taller than me and mm -hmm. twice my weight and no amount of heart or desire or determination was going to change the fact that I couldn't do it as well as they could. I could not keep up with my teammates. Do you know how it feels to be the absolute worst performer on a team? Mm. You guys are all like, no, I have no idea. Oh, no. Let me just tell you, <laughs> it, feels, it feels terrible. Yeah. Uh, but my, and, but you know what? I thought, okay, I, I can't quit. I can't quit. Why? Because you're in the middle of Antarctica and you literally can't. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. You go. Like you, yeah. you cannot quit. Yeah. You, you can't. But my expedition leader, Eric Phillips, who's one of the most incredible leaders I've ever come across, he and my teammate, George, devised this plan to help me. And they did it in this really sneaky way. Like, I don't want to ruin the chapter for everyone, but in a very sneaky way, they ended up taking weight out of my sled and making their sleds heavier so that my load would be lighter so that I could keep up with the team. And the only reason I knew what they were doing is because I overheard them talking about it in their tent before they went to sleep. So I knew what their plan was, but they did it in a way where they thought I didn't know what they were doing, even though I did. Um, but for me, it was such an important lesson, many lessons. One, there are some weaknesses that we will never overcome. No matter how much desire we have, there are weaknesses we cannot overcome. However, we can always compensate compensate right also there uh like it if we are so focused on comparing ourselves to other people in areas where they are strong we may never uncover 
our superpower, our strength, our area we can really shine. So I'll just read you. I keep this paper. I keep this note from Eric with me. Um, I always keep it on my desk because when I'm having a bad day, I review it and I just will. Sh I want to share it with you guys because I hope it will help you when you're struggling. But I wrote a, an email to Eric Phillips, the leader of the expedition, because I wrote this chapter in my book all about him and I wanted him to read it. So I said, Eric, I need your mailing address. I need to send you a copy of my book as the chapter about you is the hands down favorite. People read the chapter and tell me that your actions of deciding to help me with the weight in my sled, instead of making me feel like shit about the fact that I was the weakest link on the team is a story that really moves these readers. They think you're amazing. And so do I. Mm -hmm. And this was his response. This is what floored me. He said, um, I already bought a copy of your book just before I left for the Arctic. Thank you for the kind words you wrote, but I did the natural thing that I hope all leaders would do. I know there are some people who would have treated the situation differently, but a team is a team and solutions need to be found to keep it moving toward its goal. And this is the part that floored me. And don't underestimate your contribution. There were times when you were stronger than all of us. Your spirit, enthusiasm, and mm -hmm. humor were unwavering. I wouldn't hesitate to do another trip with you. This blew me away because I never realized that spirit, enthusiasm, and humor were a strength. I just thought mm -hmm. those are just my, that's just my personality. Those are personality traits. They're not yeah. of value to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes what we have to give may not seem like it has a lot of value to us, but it's of tremendous value to others. And the fact that Eric thought that my positive attitude and sense of humor was an asset to my team, I would never have thought of it that yeah. way. I would never have thought of it that way. I was too focused on comparing my physical strength to the physical strength of my larger teammates. And I just thought I was worthless. And so that note really changed my outlook as, so first of all, as a leader, and we're all in a leadership position, by the way. Leadership is not a designated title. Leadership's about realizing we all have a responsibility to help our teams move toward a goal. And we also all have a responsibility to be looking out for the people around us, right? So we're all in a leadership position. And as leaders, it is our responsibility to help the people around us find their sweet spot, yeah. help find the area where they can really shine. And that, you know, I used to look at people with weaknesses and be like, oh, why am I stuck with that person? until I became that person. And now I know you can't always overcome a weakness, but you can always compensate for it. And Muhammad Ali has one of my favorite quotes. Muhammad Ali was learning disabled, so he didn't do well in school. And, and he has this quote where he says, I never said I was the smartest. I said I was the greatest, right? And yeah. every single one of you watching this right now, every single one of you is the greatest at something. So do not get so caught up in comparing your skills, your life with, you know, those of the people around you, because just being you, just being who you are is a strength in itself. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you shared that, Allison. So I just I want to throw a quote back to you from your book. And again, you guys, you have to buy the book to get the details. You uh, as you shared, you kind of overheard a conversation. We won't get into it. But, you know, again, in your humility, you had a little bit of an opportunity that you helped their team. Yeah. And you have to get the book. to. So there was a compensation where there was a trade off that they came in and they helped Allison out. But Allison came right back immediately and helped them out. You have to get yeah. to read it. But how you close this out by talking about Eric. And I just want to share this. Yeah. This is how Allison describes it. Again, God, I've been like I'm having chills this whole interview. With oh, yeah. Yeah. This is how Allison describes. I heard what uh, compassionate human beings uh, should sound like. I heard what a committed team teammate sounds like. I heard what a true leader sounds like. How powerful is that that you guys came together? And like you said, it wasn't like we can bail shit. Yeah. It was like we're going to fire somebody. Yeah. yeah. You're in the middle of. I'm sitting in my tent and I'm sitting in my tent and I'm just feeling like I'm so worthless yeah. and I'm feeling like no one wants me on this team. They probably really regret, um, inviting me to be part of it. And I just bet no one wants me here. So I was already struggling physically so much. And then just 
thinking like that just call, caused me to double down on my frustration, thinking no one wants me here. And then when I overhear Eric say to George, like, oh, poor Allison, she's really struggling with the weight of her sled. And George said, I know, I feel bad for her. She's so much smaller than everybody else. And Eric said, let's, let's help her out. Let's take some weight out of her sled. And George said, good idea, I'm in. And now I'm hearing this conversation about my teammates. And instead of, you know, wanting to get rid of me, I hear them conspiring on how to help me. Yeah. And they didn't say, oh, I'm so tired of waiting for Allison. Let's take some weight out of her sled so she can keep up. They said, wow, she's really trying, but she's so much smaller. There's just, it's just, there's no way she yeah. can do this at the same level that we're doing it because of our size. And so that just meant so much to me. And it completely, I mean, not only did they take a, you know, weight out of my sled, but they took, you know, a psychic yeah emotional yeah. load off my shoulders at the same yeah. time. And they did it in a way that allowed me to keep my pride intact. And that was important as well. Yeah. Well, they, they <laughs> saw that you were giving everything you could, and you know, I was that trying. Point, as, as a leader, you see that you see that if someone is giving themselves 150% to something, it is your obligation to help them succeed because they're giving it everything. And they mm -hmm. saw that in you. It's so cool that they did that. Yeah. Yeah. And I love and what you're and again, just kind of recap that passion. You you brought a contagious enthusiasm. You brought a light humor, or, you know, the, the humor, uh, just a, a fun environment to accomplish this massive goal. You have a mission statement, war cry that you like to use. Count on me. And yeah. just this story was just perfect. You know, leading your all women's team uh, up to the climb Mount Everest. You came back in 2000. Uh, 10 conquered the summit. You talk about how failure led to that success. And you also talk about heavy, uh, heavy, ne heavy duty networking provided the opportunity. So by your net, by your enthusiasm, your leadership skills, that relentless drive, you created a, a killer team to climb Mount Everest, right? So yeah. networking, that relentless drive, talk a little bit about your count on me drive and how this yeah. network so I just, um, and that's my count on me was one of the reasons why the Antarctica trip was so hard for me, because I want to be the person that everyone can count on. I want to mm -hmm. be the person that comes through when she says she's going to come through. When I say I'm going to deliver, I deliver and mm -hmm. keeping my word and keeping my commitments and delivering is so important to me. So when I'm in a situation where that doesn't happen, it's crushing. So I'll tell you, for the first American Women's Everest Expedition, mm -hmm. our team got caught in bad weather just a couple hundred feet from the summit. Mm -hmm. We had to turn back from the summit, right? After two months on the mountain, we had to turn back from the summit. We basically got that close, had to turn back because a storm came in and we lost visibility. And mm -hmm. that failure to reach the summit was so hard on me because I felt like, I let my team down. I let, you know, we were sponsored by the Ford Motor Company. I felt like I let the sponsors down. All Discovery Network was um, had a website dedicated to our expedition. So we had all these followers, even though it was before social media. And I just felt like I let everybody down. And I really internalized that. And then I, re I realized after a while, I went back to the mountain eight years later and did make it to the summit. But what I realized is that failure is just one thing that happens to you at one point in time. It doesn't define you. Failure doesn't define you. It's one thing that happens to you at one point in time. And when it, anyone that knows just a little something about the history of Mount Everest will know the names Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, right? First guys ever, some of the mount. But guess what? Uh, there were dozens of climbers who tried and failed before those two made it to the summit. But those two, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, the famous guys, they had the benefit of all the data, all the research, all the information from those earlier climbers. And granted, those earlier climbers, because they didn't make it, they didn't become household names. They didn't get the recognition. But if those other guys hadn't had the guts to try it first, I bet Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay would never have made it. You just don't know for sure. I mean, the point is, like, when you try really hard things you're not always going to get the outcome that you want at the time. Mm -hmm. You have to just look at that as a stepping stone to success in the future. And you have to think about people who may be following in your footsteps down the road who can go on to achieve really great things like Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay because of your past experience, even if you didn't have the outcome that yeah. you wanted at the time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just a way to like reframe failure. Yeah. Well, wow. so and again, I know we're coming into time. I want to be yep. respectful of your time, Allison. So what, like yeah. after 2010, you've reached the highest peak of, of every continent, you, you know, the Ventures Grand Slam. What, like, what do you do for goals after that? Like, what are your goals personal with trooper I with my dog professional. Um, how do you how do you come back and like what you know you, yeah. you become a, a, a highly sought after uh an, an amazing keynote speaker you okay. crush it everywhere you go what what are your goals now like what are you so my goal right now on? so i think it's really important to honor the people that have paved the way for others to do great things mm-hmm. and so Right now, my goal, I'm working on a documentary film. It was, the working title was The Glass Ceiling, but we're changing the name's gonna be Sherpani, which is female, means female Sherpa. I'm making a documentary about this woman named Pasang Lamu Sherpa, because I think she's really amazing. She had this dream to climb Mount Everest because she saw her brothers climbing, her uncles, her father, but this is back in the early 90s. The government of Nepal would not let female Sherpas climb. They would only let male Sherpas. And by the way, Sherpas are an ethnic and religious minority group in Nepal. People think Sherpa means carrying things up a mountain, but the Sherpas are actually, Sherpas an ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So this woman, Pasang Lama Sherpa, she fought the government of her own country for gender equality for all women in Nepal. Because her point was, you let all these foreign women come to our country and climb this mountain in my backyard and I'm not allowed to climb it because I'm Sherpa, right? So so she took on that batter, battle for gender equality. She made, she finally was granted access to the mountain. She tried three times unsuccessfully to reach the top. Finally summited on her fourth attempt in 1993, became the first female Sherpa and the first Nepali woman to summit Everest, but she died on the way down. So she never got to tell her story. And she is Nepal's most famous contemporary hero. She's even on their postage stamp. And, And I love her story because, you know, she couldn't read, couldn't write, dirt poor, couldn't even speak the national language because Sherpas speak a different dialect, yet she had the courage to pursue her dream. And so I just think it's an important story for people to know. So um, if you go to my website, there's a little film trailer on there, a little film section if you're interested in looking at the trailer. But I hope all of you will have a chance to see it in the future. So that's what I'm working on now. And um, we do have to wrap shortly because I have to catch a flight, but I want to say for anyone watching this, if you have questions, um, please feel free to reach out on social media. I'm not super active on social, but I'll see your questions. I'm happy to answer. Or you can reach out through my website. There's a contact button. If you email me through my website, your email will come come straight to me, not to my assistant, because I don't have one. But I promise you that I will respond to anyone who gets in touch. So um, I, you guys have been such great oh, hosts. I so appreciate Kurt and Damon the opportunity yeah. to be here with you today. Uh, and Kurt, I'm so glad to finally like meet you. I know we've been corresponding for years, and I was I was so humbled and honored that you shared my book with your daughter, and I so appreciate that. Oh, Allison, you are you've made my year. I just I can't, Damon, no, I've been, friend, I've been, friend I've been, for I've been, life, right here. Yeah, I've been so for this interview, literally incredible. So. Oh, yeah. Allison, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for all you do for our for women, for young girls, our country, your inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. And we could go on and on. Thank you for your time today. And we just wish you just continued success. Thank you for everything. Back at you guys. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Happy Thanks weekend. So much. Thank We're you. Thank you. Thank you. Live here. We're going to stop the stage on Remo. We will be back again next week. Allison, thanks so much. My we pleasure. Are going to Hope shut to her see down. You.